You can start sharing if you're on Facebook and uh, welcome everybody. We're getting started in about 30 seconds officially. Giving some people time to join us in. All right. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Saints. Um, welcome to Common Ground live on Facebook, live on Zoom. We have been throwing around the terminology of uh, no longer church or church uh, un, uh, unusual or church not as usual, things like that. And uh, yeah, we're not doing it as usual. And it's like, honestly, it's what's usual. <laughs> That's actually the usual now is unusual. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, if you can see that um, there's been uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of live streams that you can probably look at right now uh, on on YouTube, on uh, Facebook, a sermon, a song, and a poem. <laughs> uh, we're not doing that today. Um, and so if that's something you want, then keep scrolling. <laughs> we're going to actually have some time of interaction. Uh, we are here uh, to really hear what God is saying um, to and through we call partners. So my name is Smiley, Jason, my name is Jason. I go by Smiley because of the joy I have in my heart um, from my intimate relationship with Jesus. And I'm one of the pastors here at Common Ground and I want to welcome you uh, to our live um, worship experience. Uh, we will be, uh, so if you're on our Zoom call, uh, there's a, a three, or three, four people that will be kind of interacting as we'll do a testimony service today. Uh, and so if you're here, yeah, just stay muted um, and we'll be able to respond in the chat. If you're on Zoom, on Facebook and want to and join in on the Zoom, uh, just let us know and we'll send you a, um, a link uh, to kind of join in. We're also going to have some time for Q&A. So if you have questions for the panelists, the people that are sharing their story, sharing who they are, sharing about their relationship with Jesus, then uh, feel free to ask in the chat and we'll be able to kind of direct that to you. Uh, we, we, we exist to be a fellowship. Um, we exist to be community love and discipleship. And so we really want to see that happen. We call, and you've heard me may say it, but we call our members partners because we believe that we are all partners in the kingdom of God. Uh, and so we all have a relationship and uh, a place uh, to be able to represent the kingdom um, well, and so you'll heal from that. So I'm gonna pray for us, uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator for today. Uh, it's Eric Vaughn, aka Coach EV, uh, who is a dynamic, powerful man of God. Uh, he has a podcast. Uh, he has been hosting these um, a revival um, all around the city, and uh, he has also, if you've seen some of our lives before, he's hosted um, some of these dialogues and conversations with our partners. And so we want to welcome him as he begins to do that. But let me pray for um, our time. And uh, yeah, so Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for each person that is tuning in. I thank you for allowing us to really experience your presence, Lord. Uh, we need you every day, every moment of the day, God, we need you. Um, and I just thank you for the way that you've saved me. Um, I thank you for the way that you have saved those on this call. And I pray uh, that you'll give us ears to hear your story uh, through, their, through their lives. Uh, guide us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Coach, you got the floor. What's up, world? This is your boy. This is your guy, Eric Vaughn, a.k.a. Coach EV. And welcome to what a testimony Sunday here at common ground zoom i am as excited as i can be we got three very special saints of god that are getting ready to share their amazing testimonies i'm telling you i don't know if i mean i i, I feel like somebody's tickling my feet right now i'm so happy to hear from them uh today and you know as 
you know, Pastor Smiley said, I'm one of the partners here at Common Ground. And uh, it is, you know, the Bible tells us that uh, in, in Revelation, it talks about uh, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimonies. And sometimes people's testimonies are just what you need to maybe change your life. And so uh, I'm excited to hear from them. I'm not going to keep this thing going further too much. I'm not going to keep talking so much. I want to introduce uh, our people today uh, that's going to be on one. We have Miss Allie Leatherman, one of our special saints, all the way from Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, then we also have uh, one of the greatest poets, just intellects that I know personally. Uh, and he just has so much of everything in his game, Mr. Micah Briggs. And Good then, morning. Then we have uh, the singer, the producer, the, I mean, I don't know what else to call him. He just got so much in his game too. Ain't nobody mad, the worldwide song, ain't nobody mad, but the devil producer, Mr. Jordan Scott. Listen, hey, I want to jump right in. Listen, I know one thing, God changed my life back on August 7th, 1994. Matter of fact, I'm just celebrating, you know, to about since August 7th, uh, myself 26 years uh, of being faithful to the call that God's called me. And so I'm excited about that. You know, I just, you know, like people celebrate birthdays. Uh, I just celebrated my soul day, my salvation day, the day that I changed my life. And so we want to hear from these guys and I just want to jump right in. We're going to start with Miss Allie first and then we'll go to Michael and then we'll finish up with Jordan in that order. And then what we're going to do is ask a few questions and then they're going to give us some answers and, and, and then we'll keep it moving. So the first question we want to ask you, Miss Allie, tell us when you got saved approximately uh, and then what caused you to give your life to the Lord? All right. Well, um, I have a similar testimony to a lot of people that grew up in the church in that I was very young when I made a decision to follow Christ. Um, I was about seven or eight. Um, and then throughout my life, there's been several um, kind of milestones and times in my life where my understanding of the gospel deepened and my understanding of what it means to follow Jesus changed. Um, so rather than talking about when I was seven or eight, because I don't have great memories of that, I'm going to talk about one of those milestones. Um, in First Samuel, um, when one of the times that the Israelites had been fighting with the Philistines after God had helped them win the battle, Samuel put up a stone and he called it Ebenezer, which means stone of help. And it was like a rem remembrance of, of um, how God had helped them. So I've got several Ebenezers in my life. And so I'm going to share one of them with you. And if, if I were to put up this stone at the place where God helped me, um, this would have been in around the fall of 2008. Um, and it would be in a parking lot in an industrial warehouse complex uh, in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. So where I was in, in 2008, uh, 2007 and 2008 was a time in my life where um, life was coming at me fast and hard. Um, I graduated from college in 2007. I got married the next day after graduation. Um, we moved from Mississippi to Cleveland. Um, so we have all the transitions that come with that of being a newlywed, looking for jobs, trying to figure out. Um, finances, try to figure out life. We also had um, in 2007 and 2008, a lot of other difficult transitions. We had several deaths of close family and friends. Um, within those years, we had health issues. We had um, mental health issues. I mean, you name it, we were going through it. So up until that point, my life had been all about being a student, right? So I'm growing up, I'm always a, st a student in school and then the student in college. And I'm a good student. I know how to do that. <laughs> so I felt like, okay, I got this, right? And then all this other life stuff started happening. Um, and I didn't feel so good at that. <laughs> I was like, whoa, wait, I don't know how to, how do I deal with all this? 
Um, so in that time, I was really feeling in that fall of 2008, feeling like a failure in a lot of areas of, of my life. I was feeling like I'd already screwed up everything. Um, just so many stresses and, and changes. Um, and the day that I'm thinking of in particular, I arrived um, early for one of my jobs. I was teaching some ballet classes. Um, and this was another place where I was feeling like a failure uh, because I had taken over these classes for a teacher who had been um, shot and killed in her home. Uh, nobody, as far as I know, they never even solved why. Uh, nobody knew she was a school teacher who didn't show up for school one morning and they found her uh, in her basement. So anyway, um, that was a difficult situation to say the least. And so I felt like I was failing uh, because obviously the kids are stressed out. The other teachers are stressed out. Um, and I feel like I can't, I can't help, <laughs> you know, like I'm, I feel like I'm bad at this. I don't know what to do. I can't help. Um, everything just felt like I was, I couldn't do it. Um, and that is where I was, I was walking around the parking lot. So the, the dance studio was in this kind of warehouse complex and I'm walking around the parking lot and just feeling like, okay, God, I'm in my early twenties and I've already screwed up everything. <laughs> like, you know, so, uh, you know, going to conquer the world with all this potential. And I'm, I, I got nothing. Um, and at that moment, I just felt in my spirit, this voice saying, my blood covers this too. And that was this moment of, a deeper level of understanding the gospel. Cause I always knew that Jesus had died and his blood could, you know, save me from my sins that were like, you know, bad things that I did. Like when I would um, lie or, or, you know, lose my temper or do something unkind, or it was, you know, it was these like bad things. But I realized that his blood covers the things that look good, but maybe come from a bad place. Um, like the mistakes that I made because I'm trying to, you know, teach these students who've gone through this horrific trauma and I'm trying to teach them out of my own strength instead of his strength, you know, and I'm, I'm going to mess up. Um, or times where I was making decisions based on wanting to get approval from other people instead of listening to God's approval. So even those good things um, that were coming from a bad place that his blood covered that too. Um, and there was it's such a feeling of peace there as I just kind of realized that no matter what I did and no matter how much of a failure I felt like, um, his blood covered it too. <laughs> you know, that uh, his grace was sufficient and his power is made perfect in weakness and it didn't matter, you know, where I came to. And, you know, um, life didn't get easy again <laughs> right away. We, you know, I was still in the stressful situation, still dealing um, with transitions and the next, you know, 2009 wasn't much easier than 2008. Um, but just that, that moment in the parking lot where I, I just had that encounter, I say, you know, we're like, Jesus met me there in that parking lot and gave me the strength, um, gave me the peace that I needed to take the next step and to just keep going. And, um, you know, he was, he was there with me and I felt that in a new way and understood the gospel in a new way. So, uh, fall of 2008, walking around the parking lot outside of Cleveland, Ohio, that was, that was an Ebenezer moment where, where Jesus came and, and helped me. Woo! Boy, you're preaching early. I just, all I want everybody to do is type in his blood covers this too. Come on, y'all. That y'all gotta say that, man. We was in church right now. We will be just shouting, giving high fives right now, saying his blood covers this too. No matter what you're going through, you can say, man, the blood covers this too. Man, it's something about that blood, Allie, that was powerful. You're talking about the blood that gives you peace. You know, it's crazy because think about this. Think about what I just said there. You know, when most time we see blood, we like, ooh, you know, we have this like feeling in the natural, but when you start thinking about the blood of Jesus, God, hallelujah, come on, Ali, you just got me going there, you got me going, I want to start speaking in tongues, but the blood of Jesus, you're talking about, gives you a peace, a serenity, you look at the blood flowing from Jesus, and you're like, thank you, Lord, you just lift your hands, Woo! all right, let me keep, let me get out of this, man, because you, Ali, you got us going there, Come on, just one more time. Y'all just say, touch your neighbor and say, his blood covers this too. <laughs> Glory. Michael, come on, talk to us. When did you get saved? And tell us your, your moment, your life-changing moment there. 
Good morning, good morning. Uh, my name, again, I'm Michael Briggs, and uh, I'm one of these partners at Common Ground, and I got saved in November of 1995. Now, I had been in church my whole life. I was raised in the church, and I mean, I got baptized at about seven, but there was, I mean, I had an ulterior motive. Uh, I wanted what everybody was getting. I wanted the grape juice and the cracker crumbs. And my sister and I figured out that we didn't know what they were saying, but if you said yes three times, everybody in the church would start clapping and screaming and you would start getting the grape juice and the cracker crumbs. So, I mean, that, that's what my motivation was at seven. And I was 20 years old when I was, uh, I was at a breaking point, um, had just left home. Uh, I had been kicked out of the military uh, went to the military straight out of high school, just didn't want to be in college, didn't want to be with my parents. I was scared, didn't know what to do and wanted to just be on my own. And so went to the army, got kicked out in 15 months uh, and went home, uh, felt really defeated, you know, thought that bootstrap mentality. I was remembering Teddy Roosevelt, this bootstrap mentality. I'll start at the bottom, mail room, whatever I have to do. And when those doors were closing, uh, so cracked for a minute and realized very quickly that I wasn't built for it. Um, you, it's, you, I don't know how you can sell crack and make money with a conscious. I wasn't good at it. People accused me often of being too nice, too friendly, being a police officer. So it just was not a good move for me. I didn't make it four months. Uh, and then I uh, went to be a janitor. Uh, I was working for a headquarters, like a corporate office for a grocery store. I was a janitor there. And then I saw an opening for a position uh, as a super, an engineer uh, supervising maintenance. And I was like, wait a minute, I can do that. And it was, it was a McDonald's position. I was like, whoa, this sounds corporate. So that was a really beautiful title to be a janitor there. So I had these two janitor jobs. And then uh, a guy saw me, his name was Chris Wiley. He walks into the McDonald's I'm working at and he remembers my, my face. He's like, Micah, what are you doing here? I'm like, man, just trying to work and hopefully eventually go to college or something. And he was like, well, you got your paperwork filled out? I was like, no. He took me to his office, filled out all the forms for me, uh, did the financial aid for me and got me connected with Langston University. Went there, uh, hopefully escaping. And I was just lost. I was searching so much to find something to fill the, the emptiness and to complete me. And it, it wasn't enough weed to do it, wasn't enough women to do it. And uh, November, uh, one of my roommates, his name is Dominique Ron. I just remember, and I know God made him do it because I was just doing whatever I felt. I was doing whatever I felt. And he's like, hey man, can I always go with you when, we, when you want to go somewhere, man? Let, it's this, this dude that's speaking at this church, man. He's not in town for a long time. Let's just go check it out. I was like, no, thank you. And he hit me with the guilt trip. He's like, man, every time you want to go buy some weed or something, I put in on it, I do all of that, man. You want to go talk to the girls? I go with you, man, every time. I'm trying to go one place. And I put a condition on it. I said, you know what, brother? If I finish typing this paper, right? And if this blizzard, because we're in a blizzard, if the blizzard stops and I can finish typing this paper, sure, I'll go with you. And I typed with those two fingers. I was, you know, so I knew it was going to be a long night. For whatever reason, I never typed that fast in my life. And I was like, wow, I finished this paper fast. The sun came out, blizzard was over. So I'm thinking, oh man, it's about to be a blunt festival. I'm just about to go kick it. Totally forgetting I made this commitment. So I'm in the room getting ready for my fun. And my boy comes in, big smile on his face. I'm like, oh man. He was like, yo, let's go, man. It's almost time to go check this dude out. His name was Dr. Eric Anthony Joseph from Azusa Pacific College. I always remember that guy and that day because he wasn't the pastor of that church. He was just visiting. And uh, I, we walked over there. Man, I smoked the whole way there. I didn't want to go. I had no desire to be there. I, I, I wanted to push that off. And uh, we get there. I literally put my blunt out on the church, letting my boy know I didn't want to be there. We went in there and we got, it sounded like the usual, you know, bunch of singing, bunch of stuff, bunch of this and that. And I was, I was disconnected and the brother started speaking and he took 
all of the bells and whistles out and was explaining this Jesus that did not want to burn me like the barbecue that I had heard in my childhood. He said he wants to love you, but he wants to be your savior and your Lord. He's not trying to be your boss. He wants to be the Lord so he can lead you out of the pain that you're in. Man, everything he was speaking was to help me and not to punish me and hurt me. And I interrupted this man's sermon, I remember. And I was like, man, I need what you got, man. I need that. And, uh, and that was the day I accepted the Lord. Uh, man, I, I never, never forgot. Like I, like there was no feeling like that because it was bigger than my emotions. It was like this release of so much hurt and it was like the acceptance of so much help and so much protection. I, yeah, that, that was when I got saved, that, that day, that day. I don't remember the exact day, but it was November, 1995. It was right before Thanksgiving break. And what was wow, the next- Powerful, that was powerful, 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 man. You know, I, you said something right from the beginning and I just want to highlight that. You said so much, I mean, just a powerful testimony, but I think those of you who are listening, um, what is your breaking point? Uh, Micah came to a situation where he came to a breaking point. Uh, and then uh, do, do you feel, are you, aren't you tired of being and feeling defeated? And so that is a powerful, powerful two questions you need to ask yourself. And I would encourage you today, right now, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't wait another day because I know that you just by prophetically that he spoke that you are at your breaking point. And I encourage you right now to um, answer the call to Christ. I mean, right there. So you never know what God is doing through any of these testimonies. I mean, right now could be your moment. Take the emotions out and just, you know, accept Christ. Amen. Glory. Let's move on to you, Jordan Scott. I mean, I just, woo, man, I'm telling you, I'm excited. We, we, hey, come on, Jordan. What's up, everybody? Can y'all hear me? Um, yeah. Okay, um, so it was funny because Michael said that he got saved in November of 1995, and um, I was born December 1995. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, "Ooh, okay," uh, but uh, yeah. So, but black don't crack, hey amen, because we look the same age. <laughs> But um, you know, my I, I I guess I could keep my my um, testimony simple. Um, but I and I guess it could kind of connect with more of the younger people because I got saved young and I got kind of got started in ministry young. Um, I had gotten actually saved, you know, the baptism and going to the altar, um, you know routine i did that around seven or eight um but i believe i believe that i got saved um in between my summer of going to high school so i was transitioning from middle school going to high school i had um we were in the midst of a service and um Someone was singing, someone was simply singing. It was during the worship portion. Um, and I just remember being really filled with the Holy Spirit, um, having a feeling of fullness um, and joy um, and release. And uh, there were so many emotions that were happening at one time because I was experiencing the presence of the Lord. And um, it's a feeling that you can't like replace or find anywhere else when you're in the presence of God and he begins to feel you. Um, I remember even prophesying to somebody for the first time. And it was like a simple word. It was like, um, and it was an older lady too. Um, and I just remember um, wanting that, that same um, taste of the presence of God. Um, 
again and again and again. And so it really like catapulted my journey. I believe God knew what he was doing because um, some people um, he's requiring to begin ministry early. Some young people he's requiring to um, begin ministry early because um, in high school, my brother had started a uh, ministry uh, at our school. Uh, of course, when I got there, I was like, I mean, I just kind of want to just fit in with everybody. I really wasn't going to the ministry. I really wasn't, you know, participating, but I know he was doing it. And I was the saved one usually during class, but I just kind of didn't want the pressure of it. But um, my 10th grade year going to my 11th grade year, my brother said, okay, um, I want you to take over because he was about to graduate. Um, he said, I want you to take over this ministry. Um, and it just really kind of, again, catapulted me into um, ministry uh, for the kingdom. I believe God was setting me up even during um, that summer between my eighth and ninth grade year. I believe he was setting me up to be a light <clears throat> that I couldn't possibly, you know, do myself, but he was setting me up to be a light to those children um, in high school. And I just believe that even for the younger people, when God chooses you and he wants to get started with you, it's time. It's not going to be, he's not going to, I don't think God was trying to negotiate with me. I don't think God was trying to, um, you know, see was I ready. He just said, come on, let's go. It's, it's time for you to to get started. Um, and sometimes God just plucks people out when he gives you an experience with him or if he speaks to you or if he um, shows you a miracle or something, God is getting something started in you. Um, and I just, I love the scripture that uh, says that he that begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it. I believe God completes everything that he starts. And even if he starts quote unquote early, he's going to finish it. Um, and so I just, I thank God that I, you know, was able to experience him so early because it literally changed my whole trajectory of life because I was one of the misunderstood kids, one of the bully kids, one of the, you know, tossed to the side children. Um, and I know a lot of it, a lot of us have experienced that. Um, but God said, I accept you. I love you. I want to get started in you. Um, and so it just pushed me into um, affecting people that I didn't even think that I was able to affect. So uh, it was between my eighth and ninth grade year going into high school. My, 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 my. You, you know, I have, you know, I'm writing down different things and you said God is not trying powerful word to negotiate with you, whether you are ready or not. Woo! That's a word right there. That'll preach. It made me think about, you know, how we used to play hide and seek as a kid and the, the, the person that was it uh, had to count. And then when the count was over, he said, ready or not. Hey, here I come. So right now, God is saying to y'all right now, ready or not, it's your time <laughs> to come and start serving God. And, and, you know, another thing you said, you know, man, y'all are saying some stuff right here. Right now, just everybody say, ready or not, here he comes. Come on, put that in your comments right there. Ready or not, here he comes. I mean, God is coming for you. It is your time. And it's your time right now. It is your time. Don't stop acting like, well, I'm not ready. You ain't gonna never be ready. Let's just face it. I wasn't ready either. You know, we just got to accept Christ and move on. Uh, you know, he talked about, Jordan also mentioned fitting in. Aren't you tired of fitting in? Uh, and God has set you up to be a light. Woo, man. Y'all happy in here today, man. I just wish I was there with you so we could be clapping and turning flips. You know, I mean, I, I can't touch y'all. I can't be touching my neighbor. We would just be standing up and doing all types of stuff. All right, let me move on. Next question, and we'll go back to Ms. Allie. Um, Ms. Allie, tell us 
how uh, this is a big deal here, I think, that we need to, you know, a lot of people have to answer because even though now we're saved, um, we have to be honest with ourselves. The Bible says that our we're made up of this flesh. We're in this world. And so we have all these distractions, all these worldly things coming up, uh, up at us. And the Bible says our flesh is at war with the spirit. The, the spirit tells us to go right. The flesh is always telling us to go left. He's always opposite of what God is saying. So tell us, how do you kind of stay saved and bring your flesh under subjection kind of to your spirit? Tell us how you, you know, live in this world, be of this world, but not, you know, you live in this world, but you're not of the world. How, how are you different? Uh, kind of in this process? How, how do you just continue to live godly, I guess, in this ungodly world when it's accepted to be, you know, so ungodly? Well, I, I mean, that's what we're all trying to figure out, right? <laughs> we're all trying to get better at as we're, you know, uh, trying to be disciples, right? After Christ, we're trying to be more like him. So uh, yeah, it's definitely, um, definitely a struggle and definitely something you have to um, put some effort into. It doesn't happen by accident. Um, one thing that I've come to really appreciate in my life is the importance of discipline and seeing discipline as a good thing um, and as a freedom thing rather than as a constraint. We often hear discipline and we think about, um, you know, saying no, like, no, I won't do that. No, I won't do that. I'm going to stay here in this little box. Um, but thinking a lot about uh, the fruit of the spirit, one of the fruits of the spirit is, is self-control um, and how how much freedom we have when we get to choose um, our responses to things instead of being controlled um, by the flesh, instead of being controlled by our desires. But we get to choose. Um, we talk about this a lot um, as I'm raising my daughter, you know, and trying to help her deal with emotions and to say, you know, it's OK to feel angry. It's OK to feel sad. It's OK to be frustrated when you're learning something new, but it's not OK to then you know, throw your math book across the room, <laughs> you know, or um, it's not okay to hurt someone when you're feeling upset. So it's like, it's okay to feel it, but not to let it control you. And there's so much freedom when you can feel whatever you need to feel, um, but have the discipline that it, it doesn't get to win. Um, so I'm, I'm learning the beauty of discipline. It's also something um, in the past 10 years, um, I've become a runner, which is not something I was before. And that's taught me a lot about discipline as well, which then translates over into my spiritual life where I realize that if I, if I don't make it a discipline, if I don't kind of schedule it in my life, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, just recognizing that, um, which kind of leads me to where I'm at right now, which is, um, learning that one of the best things I can do is just be completely honest with myself um, and be completely honest with God. He knows it anyway. Um, but, you know, it's like if I'm if I'm honest, um, yeah, I'm lazy and I'm going to choose the things that feel good and the things that um, are easy and I'm not going to have that discipline. And so I, I have to um I have to ask for that discipline for one. It's not something I can do in my own strength. I have to rely on God. Um, the book of James is, is a book that I've been studying recently. Um, and it's talking about um, how when you hear the word of God and then you don't apply it, it's like looking in the mirror and forgetting what you look like. Um, and it's like, you know, it doesn't do any good to look in the mirror and be like, no, never mind. I don't really have, you know, a big old piece of spinach stuck in my teeth or, you know, whatever. Like you have to, um, you, it, you just got to be honest. And there's also another verse a little bit later in James where it, um, it's talking about wisdom. And then right after saying, hey, you know, we need wisdom. He, he says, if you're angry and jealous, just admit it. And it was like, oh, yeah, like we just have to admit it. You know, it's just like being completely honest with yourself. Um, and when you do that and allow God to have that discipline, um, I recognize small things in my thought patterns, um, just little things that I'm going, oh, I just admitted to God that I was, you know, holding on to anger about this 
petty little thing and then realizing how I'm like keeping tally in my head still of like, well, did you see how they did that? See, 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 you know, and it's like, oh yeah, I've got to be honest. I just looked in the mirror and I saw that I had that spinach in my teeth and now I got to get, let God get rid of it. Um, but when we are honest, there's, there's so much peace and healing um, and that freedom that comes from the discipline of, of being completely honest with God and, and allowing him to work um, in your heart. Cause that's, that's, what's the best for us is to be more like Christ. And um, it doesn't always feel good in the process, but the result is so nice, which uh, is also something coming back to something I've learned from running. Um, running doesn't always feel good in the moment, um, but you never regret having done it. You know, so it's like letting God discipline you doesn't always feel good in the moment, but you're going to feel so much better in the end. It's worth it. Uh, uh, somebody catch me. <laughs> Boy, you got, well, you got so much in you, Ashley. You got so much in I don't know about y'all, but man, y'all are helping me today. I got, I just can't. She says, oh, God, she said so much. She said some discipline is a good thing, y'all. Come on, put that in your comments. Discipline is a good thing. Now, I don't know if I heard this wrong or not. I ain't never heard nobody say this. She says schedule the discipline in your life. <laughs> My God, that was powerful. She said, don't let your, you know, and, and, and to capsulize it, don't let your feeling good get the best of you. Oh, man. Allie, Miss Allie, y'all saying some stuff, man. The book of James, she said, there's peace and healing when you honesty, when you honest with yourself. That's powerful. You know, everybody's talking about, man, I need some peace. Well, well, go ahead and look in the mirror and get that piece of spinach out your mouth and stop asking like it's, you know, like you got this thing all together. Just and, and stop lying to yourself. I mean, Allie, that's good now. Ooh, we y'all. Woo, I, man, I'm just be honest with you. I'm about to burst over here. I don't know how much more I can take. Come on, Mr. Michael, talk to us how you uh, just, you know, deal with this crazy world that we live in and you still live like uh, a saved man. You know what that's say? Uh, uh, I feel like it's a process. And the, for me, the process, it begins with being really intentional about insulating my spiritual growth. And, and what I mean by insulating my spiritual growth, that the day I got saved, juice, that pump, it was like a spiritual steroid when I got saved. Like, uh, you know what? I really believe that this walking on water is going to happen. Like, I, there was nothing that was in my way. And the reality was that in that moment, I was so connected to this speaker, you know, of who God is, that he was hollering at me. He was bumping in my ears constantly and I could feel those vibrations. But guess what? When I wasn't getting fed that word of God, when I wasn't in that connection with him getting fueled up through that prayer, when I wasn't getting fueled up because when two or more gathered in him, he was in the midst, I was on E. And that salvation was still there, but spiritual stamina to get through the pain of life and to defeat depression was invisible. It didn't, it, it was gone, it evaporated. So being very intentional about insulating your spiritual life, like that word of God is literally your spiritual Gatorade because you're gonna get tired. You're gonna feel, I mean, being saved doesn't mean you don't feel insecure. It doesn't mean that depression is not going to try to drown you. It does not mean that the pain of life you're exempt from. And that's what I feel. I was hearing so many sermons about what was not going to happen to me that I was not getting in the word of God for myself and hearing, well, wait a minute, if I'm crucified with Christ, that's, that's a process where there's some pain involved. And when you look at that Old Testament and everything was sealed by blood, for there to be blood, some got to get cut. So there was pain involved. And for me, being able to dig back and find out, well, wait a minute. I didn't just wake up one day feeling like I could not 
make it to the next day. It was a process of hurt throughout years that was being added into me. And I was able to get through those layers because one, when you don't hold it in, guess what? Can't nobody ever snitch on you when you tell on yourself. So being able to have brothers and sisters that I could talk to honestly about where I was, I was able to get encouraged and, and kind of like reaffirmed and rebuked. And all of that worked together to help me see, you know what? I don't just wake up feeling saved and feeling good. That It's just not my reality. It's like waking up and forgetting to eat every day, forgetting to drink water. You're going to be malnourished and then you're gonna be dehydrated. So I had to have that. And then being able to re kind of refurbish that, you know what I mean? I needed that on a consistent basis because the reality that it was two things that were separating me. Guilt, it was a guillotine that would like cut me off from God literally severing me from God where I didn't want to see him and I pretended like he didn't want to see me and then shame it was like the stench that made me not want to be around God or anyone else and that isolation was what the enemy would use to keep me feeling helpless and hopeless and so being able to discuss my dirt you know people talk so much about their blessings that I mean I was just I was done with it I'm like well every day of mine don't feel like pink hearts yellow moons, orange stars, and green clovers. I don't feel like that every day. So being able to find, not a big group, but being able to connect myself with people that were honest about their walk with God and, be, and being able to know that in the word of God, it says that Jesus endured this full gamut of emotions. So wait a minute. So Jesus took thoughts captive and was victorious. So it was women that saw this strong carpenter and was like, oh girl, he fine, you better give him, show him a little leg, show him a little something. He went through everything, every emotion I went through. So me feeling that way and knowing that, it's like, wait a minute, I'm okay. Peter denied him. You know what, I'm okay. The woman at the well had five husbands and he was like, girl, I got love for you. So I'm okay, I'm not the dirt and the dung that I feel like right now. So being able to deny my feelings, that, that's where the faith kicks in. My dirt, really was helping me because God was taking all that stank, that stench and dung, and he made it fertilizer. And so I, I'm able to grow through a process. It ain't overnight. Y'all just trying to, y'all trying to hurt me over here. I mean, like, I, I like, this is not fair. You know, I just, just give you a moment, man. Y'all, y'all trying to hurt me with this word, man. Y'all got so much, go listen, now I can't take this. This man said the word of God <laughs> is like the, is like your spiritual Gatorade. <laughs> I mean, you know, like when you come behind Michael, man, I, I can't even go into all this stuff. He's talking about dirt. He's talking about fertilizer. He's just talking about so much, man. I, you, I'm not, I'm not gonna do you any. I'm not gonna do what you say any like injustice by like commenting on it, man. It's just too much. But I just want to say this. He said. One of the things, and like a million of the things he said was guilt and shame tries to separate us from the love of God. Don't allow that, man, because so many people do feel guilty and they feel shameful about their life and their actions, man. We're in a war. This is a fight. And uh, we just need to go on, you know, when, you know, we're, we're thirsty and we just need to go on and drink some of that spiritual Gatorade. <laughs> the word of god you know it talks about that you know go on joy go on go on leave mike i ain't gonna mess with you no more <laughs> okay um the question was how do we um battle our flesh i just i mean like like you said there were so many good words um for me personally that has been a journey uh one of the helpful tips that i could give anybody is accountability 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 get around some people that are striving to do the same thing you're trying to do um and that is live um a life that is as pure as you can get it now i will say this um that it is a continuous everyday journey um and I am still working out my journey uh, with battling my flesh. Um, I'm still on my journey. And so the way I used to think maybe two years ago, I have new information about 
uh, uh, certain things now. Um, and to be transparent and honest with you all, um, I have been a, a sex addict for years. Um, and so I took it upon myself this year to join a um, Sex Addicts Anonymous group. Um, and so what we do is, it's basically like Alcohol Anonymous. You kind of just share, you know, who you are and what you deal with and things like that. And that type of thing, being around people that are, are very brutally honest um, can break something in you. You know, the, the, uh, the Bible says, uh, you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Um, and you got to know the truth about yourself. You cannot continue to have this. I'm blessed of the Lord, highly favored. I'm always blessed. I'm always this. I'm always on 10 for Jesus. That is not, that is a fantasy that is not real. Okay. That is not real. Um, Paul even talked about all of the things that he was struggling with all the time. I'm talking about 24 seven, the thorn in his flesh. He was struggling all the time. Okay, and he was one of the most prolific writers in the Bible and one of the most spiritual leaders that probably walked this earth. Um, and he struggled. And you have to understand that it is a process and you have to continue to learn and continue to walk and continue to build on it. Um, I've learned this year how to give myself grace. Um, not being so hard on myself for struggling because we have fleshly bodies period you're going to fail but in jesus in christ we are renewed we're restored he gives us grace his grace is sufficient you know even when we mess up i'm talking to the people that's struggling okay um even when we mess up his grace comes in like a flood i'm talking about instantly you know what i mean um and so i'm learning that I don't have the power to maintain my um, quote unquote perfection or purity, but that he has the power. That's one of the first steps in recovery is realizing that you are powerless to whatever it is. And we accept a God who is bigger than us that can basically give give us purity and and and, and uh, sustainability throughout our process um and so that's that's the first step but it's so hard when we've been in control of everything in our lives we know how to pay our rent on time our phone bill we know what job we go to we know what how much gas we put in our car i'm in control i i chose this shirt that i put on okay <laughs> i chose exactly what i wanted to do today and so when you are in control of everything in your life, it is hard, it is difficult. And we can say, yeah, God is in control, but are you really allowing him to be in control? I don't, I, I'm telling you, it's a humbling experience because I was able to sustain the, the purity for so long and then whoop, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm doing something. And then I started smelling myself. Yeah, you're doing right. You did. Then whoop. Then I fall off because I was trying to do it in my own strength and my own abilities. And I wasn't allowing a God who was bigger than me, which is the first step to recovery, a God who was bigger than me to come in and do what he wants to do. You have to allow God to really take control. It's a humbling experience. And I also want to speak to anxiety too. Um, a lot of people deal with anxiety, but the Bible tells us um, to only worry about the things of today, to only worry about the things of today, whatever is going on today. Just be grateful for those things today. And I can tell you, my flesh wants to rise up all the time when I start thinking too much into the future. God, how am I going to take care of this? And how am I going to pay for this? And how am I going to do this? Those are all fleshly ideas that God is telling us to stop thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow and just be grateful for today. I always try to make sure that I'm thinking about what he has done for me in my past and so that I won't be anxious about God. What is next? What is next? Because anxiety 
is a form of a flinch in a way. I'm not saying that because you, you know, deal with anxiety, because everybody, because I deal with it, but I know that when I stop myself and say, you're thinking too much into the future, you're thinking too much into what you have going on, you're thinking too much into that. I know when I stop myself and I just say, you know what, God has done all of these things for me. I'm grateful. My anxiety begins to lower down and it begins to calm. And when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, you get what I'm saying? And so I just want to speak to like the people that are like dealing with real for real issues and just my journey of what, how I'm going through the process. And one thing about it is if you walk in grace, the shame that uh, Coach EB talked about, if you walk in grace, you'll always accept um, his love for you because a lot of times we don't give ourselves enough slack. You know, I've been in the gym for a year now and I'm just now seeing the changes that I want to see. I'm just now seeing the little small increment changes. So if you're saying I'm on this journey to freedom, I'm on this journey to recovery, I'm on this journey to getting better, you're not gonna receive the results overnight. You're gonna have to fail. You're gonna have to make some, you're gonna have to make some failures, but you can look back a year from now. If you start on your journey now and say, you know what? I'm going to start this road to freedom. You can look back in a year from now, you're not the same as you were today. And so I just wanted to give some nuggets to whoever it is that's like wrestling with some real, like this, this is real deal stuff. So that's, that's my, you know, my little tips on how to help anybody that's going to. Well, Jordan, you shifted me and the Lord wanted me to share this word with you today um, that because of your freedom, you know, you already had, because you shared that, not only you, you shared that with your group and some close people to you, because you came out and shared that to the world, uh, what you're battling with, uh, God is releasing even another level. He's already given you a certain level of freedom, but he's giving you and even another level of freedom, another level of grace to deal with your the challenges that you 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 talked about today. Uh, you just you just like stepped up another level, you know. And and praise God for that. And those of you who heard his incredible testimony and, and something he's dealing with, you have an opportunity, you know. Right now, I would encourage you to release what you're being. The, some of the challenges that you are, are being affected with right now. And, and, and there's so much freedom. You know, when he spoke that, it was a sense, you know, even though I'm in a room by myself, uh, but I just sensed the presence of God, you know, even the more because there was something that he released into the atmosphere. So, uh, man, praise God for that. You know, you know, Jordan, I almost called you Pastor Jordan right there because you, you gave us so much stuff right there, man. But I just wanted to just share with you what the Lord spoke specifically to you concerning that. And I just praise God for that. Moving right along um, in our final question of the day, man, I don't know about you, but I am, like I said, anybody knows my size, it takes a lot for me to get full, but they have fed me early. I feel like I've eaten at a buffet. I've had a five course meal. I've just had everything that you wanted. I've had some little Debbie snack cakes, y'all. I mean, grandma cookies, everything I've been challenged with in my life. I didn't have here today. So as I get ready to close, I'm gonna try to drink me some water or something with it. So uh, so the last question is, and Miss Allie will go through, uh, how do you share your faith in today's world? How do you share your faith in today's world? Yeah, this is something, um that growing up in the church um got a little bit of trauma that i got to unlearn <laughs> um because i was always hammered into me you know as a young age um are you sharing your faith are you witnessing are you this is you know and it was it kind of turned into this like it wasn't about loving other people and it wasn't about glorifying god it was about uh keeping a tally mark of how good you were <laughs> And what you have done, like how many people have you led to Christ? And it's like, well, wait a second. Uh, I'm not the one doing this. 
<laughs> like it's God who saves us. I don't save people. Um, so there's a lot that I've kind of had to unlearn because that, that was very off putting to me growing up and kind of always hearing this is like, you need to do this and you need to do this. And it was all about kind of turning God into a product that I had to sell. And I had to be the top salesman, you know, the top producing salesman this month. Um, and uh, that's not who God is. And when we try to sell him, like, uh, you know, a door to door salesman, you're ringing on the doorbell. Hey, would you be interested in buying God today? Um, uh, then when, it, like we've been talking about, it's a process and it, and we fail and life is not perfect just because you're a Christian. And so when we've sold somebody that that's what happens um, in that kind of mindset of like, I need to put another tally mark in my column that I saved somebody and I got to like convince you that God is so wonderful. And then life is hard. And then they're like, what, this isn't what I signed up for. Um, so the, what I've been kind of processing through is the story in numbers um, when the Israelites are wandering in the desert and God sends venomous snakes among them. And a bunch of them, a bunch of the Israelites are getting bitten by these snakes and they're going to die. And um, God tells Moses to make this bronze snake and to stick it up on a pole and like hold it up high. And anybody who looks at that snake would be healed from their snake bites. Um, and then later on, this is the analogy that's applied to Jesus in the New Testament that he can be lifted up like that snake. And when we lift him up, then other people can see him and be healed. And so I, I'm realizing that my job isn't to go out there and look at everybody as like, who can I save today? Um, but my job is to make much of Jesus. And the more that I lift him up um, as that bronze snake, then that's, he's going to do the work of drawing people to himself. And my job is to lift him up in every area of my life and everything I do Um as a job, I'm a teacher. Um, so obviously I have opportunities there. I do teach in Christian programs. So I have very, you know, opening um, there to, to be able to, to include my faith um, in how I deal with my students and the subjects that we, we talk about. We talk about science. Um, so our faith comes out in that as well. Um, but I'm also realizing recently, especially with this season of the with the pandemic and so much of our life is on social media and everything these days of really questioning um, my own desire for an audience. I'm also a, a dancer, so a performer. And it's kind of like, um, there's all this like performance aspect and my own relationship with that. And am I trying to make much of myself or am I trying to make much of God? And really, um, you know, in this season where it's like, if you don't take a picture and put it on social media, it didn't really happen. You know, and it's like, am I, am I pursuing God even when no one is watching? You know, am I um, taking time to be with God even if, you know, you know, am I, or do I feel like, well, it only counts if I take a picture of my Bible and post it on Instagram, or, you know, it only counts if I have some nice little quote that I can post on my social media. You know, it's like um, in Matthew 6, Jesus um, is talking about how you know, we don't, we don't live out our faith in front of others to get our own attention. It is to, um, you know, that when you're giving to the poor, you don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Um, and when you pray, you go in your closet and you pray in secret and you're not making a big deal about it um, to everyone. And so just kind of questioning myself of like, with God, do I love him enough to pursue him even when no one's watching? Do I glorify him? Do I make much of him and praise him even if no one's around? Um, do I glorify him in doing the things he's asked me to do um, in other ways? Like as a dancer, do I love dancing enough that um, I will glorify God that way even if no one's watching? Um, will I, um, you know, will I glorify God enough to um, be disciplined in my eating habits and in running? Um even if no one's watching, even if there's no race that I'm training for, or again, you know, not taking a picture and putting it on social media, will I enjoy my time with my family? And, you know, even if there's no picture that's like, look at our cool family. <laughs> um, anyway, it's just um, something I've been thinking about recently is that performance aspect and trying to take myself out of sharing my faith and, and really turning the spotlight on God and just lifting Jesus
please God, no, unfreeze her, please. <laughs> I mean, this is like watching a you're the favorite part of your TV. There you go. Woo! You <laughs> you froze for a minute, Patty. You was coming to the climax, and we what? Well, tell say that last whatever you said, please. You yeah, know. yeah, I'm not sure exactly where I got frozen. Um, but yeah, it's uh that just really having that loving, loving God enough, um, and making the most of him, putting the spotlight on him, regardless of what people see of me. And so sharing my faith by lifting Jesus up as that bronze snake and allowing the spirit to work and allowing him to draw people unto himself. And all my job is just to lift up, lift him up and put the spotlight on him. You know what? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Allie. I mean, you really ought to be ashamed of yourself. I mean, you got all that stuff in you, that all that word in you, and you just sit your little quiet self around something. Man, I'm so happy that I heard you today. You just went in my house and talked about me and just, just I mean, you shouldn't have talked about me like that. You said some stuff right there. And, and you know, oh God, it was just so powerful. You, you, what you, like what I saw just to wrap up what you said was, you know, it's one thing, you know, you talked about tally marks and, you know, and the, the God produ producing salesmen. And it was just like, ah, you hit you. But you, you, you're you concentrating on just, you know, like working and living for God when no one else is watching. And so when someone else is, wa oh God, someone else is watching, your, your, your light is so bright that it's going to resonate and come out and people are going to be able to see it when you come out this time versus you just going out and for the for the public say hey hey Jesus this Jesus that but in reality you don't have anything built inside of you because you ain't been dancing you know you dance for us on Sunday and it'd be like oh my god but then you never dance at home when it's just you and him that's powerful Ali. that's deep there you went deep on us there you had to boy I heard some stuff there Am I, uh, what, what, let me, I wrote it down. Hold on, let me look. And then I'm going to move on to the next because it was powerful. Am I pursuing God when no one else is watching? God, you said something. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Alan. You, you just, you know, I ain't messing with you no more. Come on, Michael, tell us, you know, um, how do you, uh, how do you share your faith today? You know what, um, a big way I share my faith is number one, I wait for open doors because God opens them. Uh, I And plus I, I'm, I have to be self-aware. I recognize that because of my struggles and my insecurities, you know, knowing the sins that, that, that punish me to make me have to kneel at the cross, whether it's my lust and, and, and sex and my mind, whether it is addiction, whether it's weed, uh, drugs or just my, my overeat, all these different things, I have to be self-aware to know, you know what? I need to visualize where God wants to use me. And God opens these doors and then I have to have enough courage to take advantage of them. Uh, whether it's at my job, whether it is a person I just met, but the way that I notice those open doors, honestly, are when I'm more connected with them because I see a lot of instances where I was so busy that I had to squeeze in and try to make time for God. And then when I'm looking back and I finally get that time with God, I end up seeing all these examples of, man, there were so many opportunities and I was so busy dealing with all my stuff that this person could feel like all hope is lost because I didn't obey God in that moment. And so part of me being able to do that is getting plugged in and then taking off that veil and just not speaking Christianese because people are more looking at my behavior than they are waiting for this blessing conversation of what's next. Like the biggest way I've seen, even with my own children, has been me living for the Lord in stereo because my children, they're like, wait a minute, I know you're struggling with some stuff, I got a bunch of brothers and sisters and we got different moms. So clearly dad's struggling with some stuff. So they had to be able to see me walking in it before they wanted to hear what I was talking about. So I think a big piece of that is being able to walk 
with the Lord in stereo because people are going to come to you. My, my son never used to ask me questions about my faith because my life was just this big hodgepodge of hypocrisy. Yeah, my heart was with the Lord, but with my actions not being, I was probably turning more people off than I was awakening their taste for the Lord. So I think we got to be mindful of that because once we're believers, guess what? There's a responsibility that comes with our lives to whether we are, am I opening a door so they can see the Lord or is my life closing a door so they like, man, if that's what God is, I don't want that. Look what you got. So walking in that thing and then taking advantage of those opportunities when there's open doors and fighting against your insecurities and your fear, because there's always going to be a fear. Wait, it's not going to be politically correct to say that. Mm, you might lose a friend. Um, if you say that, your family member might not call you back. I mean, like being able to have uncomfortable conversations and speak the truth of God in my life to my loved ones has caused me to miss some calls for months at a time. And, and I've, you know, been deleted out of some phones and, and being able to take that, being able to take that. So, I mean, just one day at a time, staying plugged in so that I don't miss those opportunities. Because it's very easy to offer our own friendly advice when God is trying to use us not to offer our own friendly advice, but to speak for him. So. I, you know, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes, man, you can hear one thing and it just takes you off into a full tangent and you just miss, you know, like, you know, because I already know Michael was saying a lot of stuff and I'm going to let y'all, 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 whatever he said to y'all, you know, y'all get for y'all. I'm just tell you with me. This man that told me, <laughs> this man has created a whole new language today. All I kept thinking about was, are you speaking Christianese? <laughs> My God, y'all, all other stuff. I know he said some other stuff, but I'm sitting here thinking about Vietnamese and all this other stuff. And he said, are you speaking Christianese? God, man, that's a word in itself right there. He, I mean, all other stuff y'all can put with y'all, but I'm telling you what hit me, you know, and he said about, talked about just staying plugged in and he, in his, in his lifestyle, had to follow and so what i see is we got a lot of people talking christianese without the lifestyle oh my god mm -hmm. Woo. okay jordan go ahead i mean how you share your faith today um i think that walking in your purpose um is a clear sign of uh the light of christ like walking in your real like real purpose um and doing exactly what god has called you to do um because you won't be more anointed in anything else other than what god has like really called you to do um like when you like are right in the vein of what his purpose is for you it literally just, it, it blows up. And his light reaches far more people um, in you, um, uh, from you, than it would you doing something that, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, knocking on anyone, but just doing something that you've always done or, you know, working a job that may not, it just, it pays the bills, but it may not necessarily um be what god really wants you to do and that's a hard decision because you know a lot of times the way our life flows we have to make decisions um that are just going to like put food on the table or you know i understand like everybody's life trajectory is hard because you know everyone doesn't have the luxury that other people have to like really start the business that you really want to start that you know that you've been wanting to do like like for years or like start the you know the the group or the whatever it is but i do know that god's light is heavy and the gospel is like even without you even saying anything um just for example coach eb i he's walking in in line 
with what God wants him to do. It's through basketball, you know, and whether he opens his mouth or not, somebody is seeing the light of Christ in him. He don't even have to say Jesus. They see something different about what he's doing in his purpose than what somebody, it's important to walk in your purpose so that God's light is the brightest in you. We all carry a different light, right? Um, but I've seen what he's anointed you to do. You don't even have to do any work. And so whatever it is that God has called us to do, whatever it is, whatever business, whatever, whatever God wants to start in you, and this might be a great time to do it, especially during the pandemic, because we have a lot more time. And then again, we're opening stuff back up. A lot of stuff is happening, but I would encourage anybody to start whatever it is that God has purposed in your heart. That, that thing that you really wanted to do, that thing that you wanted to do since you were a kid, that you always knew, this is what I want to do. And I guarantee you showing your light will be so easy <laughs> because you're walking in your purpose. Showing that light is easy. And so the way that I share my light is through music, of course. Um, it's, it's easy. It's like water. It's literally like, I just, because it's, 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 it's what God like purposed in my heart to do. And that's not everybody's calling, but whatever it is that God has called you to do, that's where the light shows the brightest. God can do something. Even now you can make a decision and you had some, a lot of us are going to have to step out on faith because we have been depending on whatever it is that's been putting food on the table for so long. But I guarantee you that first step of faith can release something so major that it will double or triple whatever it is that you were making or whatever it is that was provided for you. It will triple it because you're actually walking what walking in your purpose. Like I know a lot of times we go for what is stable, but I think God is calling us into the deep. I'm speaking to myself too because it's hard doing. It. I'm I, listen. This ain't no easy thing. This faith walk. Ain't no easy piece of cake walking the park candy land. But I'm telling you, that step of faith, Peter had to get out of the boat in order for God to show himself like Jesus, for, for Jesus to really be Jesus. Like we wouldn't have seen that side of Jesus if Peter hadn't have taken that step out of it, like out of the boat. He had to walk in, uh, walk, walk with Jesus. And even when he started falling, Jesus was there to pick him back up. Like Jesus won't embarrass you. I, I kid you not, if you step out in faith, he won't embarrass you because if it's what he really wants you to do, he won't let it fail. I'm going to go back to the scripture. If he starts something, he's going to complete it. So that's how I share my light. That's how I encourage anyone else to share their light. Walking your purpose is, is, is bigger than you. Um, and like I said, I, I don't have the words. I'm going to ask... Um, like y'all just like y'all have done too much of the day, and I'm not gonna y'all ain't gonna just keep doing this to me. Uh, I know Aaron Briggs just recently. I think Michael, you and Aaron just nod your head. Y'all just recently had a little baby, correct? Is that oh, correct? Yeah, yeah, she's two months old. How? She's two months and some change. Okay, can one of y'all come over here and burp me? Because <laughs> I just I'm so full, man. Yeah. <laughs> Can y'all burp? Because I know y'all used to burp somebody. I need to be burped after all this, this work. Y'all got me full over here. <laughs> y'all just uh, expected me to act right on here after all this phenomenal work. My God, Jordan over here, Prophet Jordan speaking. We got you know, Prophet Micah and Prophetess Ali. I mean, she just gave us, I mean, my God, man, I don't know how y'all can stand it. Like, oh, my head is just, woo, man, we've had so much today. Um, I, I, man, just, I, I just thank God for you guys' testimonies today. Uh, let me just, you know, and, and I don't know, Smile, I'm just gonna do this. Does anybody, I just want to give anybody in you know, a one final word. If you just had anything, you know, Ali, uh, Micah, and Jordan, we'll just close with this section of it. Is there anything you want to leave with the people? Just 
you know, uh, a final word just on your own that God may be sharing with you. We'll just start with you, Allie, and finish it off. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, kind of going in line with what I was saying with sharing your faith and how it's it's about making uh, making much of God, not making much of us. Um, and, you know, as Jordan's talking about our purpose, you know, it's like, what is our purpose? Our purpose is to glorify God, you know, and now how we glorify God is going to be different for each individual, but glorifying God is our purpose, not glorifying ourselves. And um, anyway, it, it's just something that uh, recently been kind of looking and how we even when we read Bible stories, we set ourselves up as the heroes. Like we read about David and Goliath and the takeaway is I'm going to be like David. And it's like, wait, shouldn't the takeaway be look what God did? Not look what David did through God, but look what God did. And he happened to use David. Um, so that's kind of the takeaways. We're talking about our personal testimonies, just, you know, living your life so that your testimony is look what God did. And he happened to do it in my life versus look at what I did through God. It's he's, he's the focus. He's the spotlight. I'm just shaking my head at you, Alan. That's all I'm doing. I'm just going to shake my head. <laughs> Go on, Mike. I ain't going to make me keep comment on stuff. Y'all just trying to get me to say something crazy. Go on. Come on, Mike. Go on. Give us a final word. You know what? I think the biggest thing that I've had to recognize and that I hope people can see is that God is not the Geppetto who is pulling puppet strings to have fun with your life. Like all of the, the trauma that you go through, everything has this purpose and God is using that literally for you. Like every horrific thing that I can remember. The crazy part is I can remember what it was, but the reality is that God didn't let that crush me. And you can be in a place where you can focus so much on your horrific past that you don't even recognize, wait a minute, I'm not in that. I'm not there. I'm not experiencing that anymore. So it's really easy to not see God when you're not recognizing, look at all these miracles that have happened to me. So I, I just encourage people, live your life for the Lord in stereo with the covers off. You know what I'm saying? When Adam and Eve got those fig leaves off of them, man, they were standing there naked. And the reality was that, man, we really blew it and we really deserved the death that was promised and God let them live. And just recognize that, man, God knows the real me God knows everything that I'm ashamed of and embarrassed by, and he still loves me. And being able to reconnect with that helps me remember, hey, it wasn't because of some poem you said, dude. It wasn't because you said things the right way. It was because I love you enough to look past all these L's you keep taking. And so God has recognized me as saying, guess what, son, you're not the loser you think you are. You're my son. And that helps me not wallow in self-pity. That helps me not try to compare myself to other people. Because when I compare myself to other people and their blessings, I always come up short. And God is like, yo, I got a relationship with you. I had listened to Marcello's sermon and I was just like, man, that's so much of me when I think of the prodigal son. I could see myself in the prodigal son with that failure. But then I can also see myself as the brother was like, man, hold up. Now that I'm do I'm trying to do right, I'm, I'm handling my business and I'm still not getting what I think's coming to me. And the reality is that when I remember Micah Briggs, if you actually paid for all the crimes you committed, you'd have been dead a long time ago. So recognizing that God is the God of grace, he's the God of love and every spanking I've received, all the pain that I've received, has pushed me to being alive today to where I can say, man, thank you, Lord. So recognizing what he's already done and not having a handout for tomorrow before I say thank you for yesterday. That is what really keeps me because it's a miracle that I'm even married. When Jordan said he battling sex addiction, bruh, I've been going to the classes for years. You know what I'm saying? So to be able to be married, I have to recognize God, you give me gifts 
even though in the past I haven't just been greedy, but I've been guilty. And he is a gift giver. So recognizing how far we've come and staying connected so we don't end up there. So that that's that's my takeaway, man. Hold on, because it's gonna hurt. It's gonna be some bumps. But if you hold on, man, God ain't never let me fall. Never. Every fall I've had is because I jumped out of his arms and ran in the opposite direction. He's never gonna fail you. Amen. Amen. Jordan. Um I my my takeaway or really not necessarily a takeaway, but just my final word is just uh continue to let to allow the grace of God uh to really be the grace of God in your life. Um accepting the grace of God, um, not walking in guilt or shame anymore. Um, it's one of the hardest things that I've had to let go of because I was um always in a situation where I felt like I needed to be something that I wasn't or or literally perfect. Um, so I judged others and judged myself, but um, allow the grace of God to really be the grace of God. Allow the grace of God to give you the strength that you need to be the better you. Um, it's not a hard beating God is trying to put you in a wrestling match match or cage or whatever. He's trying to love you out of whatever it is that you're wrestling with, whatever it is that you're dealing with. Um, and you don't have to beat yourself up about it anymore. That's what I'm walking in and trying to continue to walk in today. Also, the scripture came to my mind uh, that we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Whatever it is that we face on the daily basis, it won't destroy us. It won't take us out. It won't defeat us. Uh, whatever it is that we are struggling with, wrestling with, whether it be anxiety, I know what that feels like. Whether it be addiction, I know what that feels like. Whatever it is that we wrestle with, it will not crush us it will not take over. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Um, he loves us dearly and he's made us conquerors. And so we can be encouraged today that the fight is not over, but the battle is actually already, it's already won. It's already a fixed fight. And so you won't fail. You won't be defeated. Um, and God is pretty much fighting for you. It's a fixed fight. So God bless y'all, man. I love you. The word amen means so be it. And so I think that's the appropriate word for everything that has uh, has been said today. Uh, you know, amen. And I would encourage you because <clears throat> the last thing that Jordan said that is so powerful and so uh, so many powerful words. And I thank God for everyone. But I thought this was something that we can end with is uh, with this portion of it as we think about uh, what God means to us, what he has meant to us and what, you know, he will continue to mean for us that he is trying to love you through whatever you are going through. Just let that resonate. Uh, and if you don't remember anything else, he is trying to love you. He wants to love you. He just wants to love you with no strings attached. He wants to help you through whatever you are going through. So I encourage you today to take to heart all of these unbelievable nuggets that have been shared and uh, just, uh, man, just I, I, those of you who will come back and watch this, I, I would encourage everybody to share this Facebook you know, thing again, and people need to hear these testimonies and, you know, I praise God for you. So smiley, that's it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Look, uh, I'm through it all y'all. Oh my goodness. <laughs> like, uh, on Facebook, y'all probably couldn't see my reactions, but I was like, I'm all up in my closet, like everything. So we are going to end our live on Facebook, but we're going to hang out a little bit longer on Zoom uh, just to kind of chat it up a little bit and connect with some folks that's here. So if you still want to join us 
our link is open. We'll let you know uh, for that. But um, whoo, that was a lot. <laughs> so dynamite, dynamite. Let me pray a word over our time, and I'm in the in the in the live. So, God, I thank you for the words that have gone forth. I thank you for uh, salvation, for the gift that you've given us. I thank you for the 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 flood of grace. I thank you for taking our our dirt and making it fertilizer. Lord, I just thank you for allowing us to really um, declare you and not try to make a name for ourselves. So I just pray that you continue to convict and probe our hearts, all those that are watching, listening in. I also pray that you will help us to really walk into that freedom and that grace that you've given us. Uh, continue to grow us as a fellowship and a community in Jesus' name. Amen.